Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the afternoon Downing Street briefing. Uh, let me begin, as usual, with the latest figures. 4,171,408 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the United Kingdom. That includes 127,722 tests carried out yesterday. 272,826 people have tested positive. That is an increase of 2,445 cases since yesterday. And sadly, of those tested positive for coronavirus across all settings, 38,376 have now died. That's an increase of 215 fatalities since yesterday. This new figure includes deaths in all settings, not just in hospitals. And of course, every one of those deaths is a tragedy for the family involved, and our thoughts are with all of them. Now, as the Chancellor outlined yesterday, those numbers show we are now past the peak. And as we continue to flatten the curve, we are able to start reopening parts of the economy. We are also looking at how to begin relaxing other measures so that we can re-establish some normality in other parts of our lives. Which brings me to something which many people have been eagerly awaiting news about, and that's the return of live sport. Now, for more than two months after sport stopped, and after weeks of round-the-clock discussions with medical experts and professional sports bodies, I'm delighted to announce today that the government has published guidance which allows competitive sport to resume behind closed doors from Monday at the earliest, and crucially, only when it's safe to do so. It's up to each individual sport to decide exactly when to resume competition. They know their sports best. But football, tennis, horse racing, Formula One, cricket, golf, rugby, snooker and others are all set to return to our screens shortly, with horse racing first out of the gate in the North East next week. It's been a huge challenge to get to this point. We've taken a forensic, clinician-led approach, working with Public Health England and the Department of Health every step along the way. And we've had dozens of meetings and published pages of detailed guidance, outlining first how to get athletes back into socially distanced training, and then back into close contact training. And throughout all of this, we've put the safety of the athletes, coaches and support staff first and foremost. And by working so closely with the sports themselves, we've made sure that it's been a collaborative, consensual effort to create the safest possible environments for everyone involved. Now, the guidance outlines various measures that need to be in place for an event to go ahead and to keep everyone involved safe. That includes a screening process for coronavirus symptoms at the venue, a one-way system for people and vehicles, minimising the use of dressing rooms, and of course, maintaining social distancing wherever that is possible. And as all sports fully recognise, ensuring the mental health of their athletes and staff is as important as their physical health, particularly in these very difficult times. And our guidance today reinforces that. It's taken a lot of hard work to get us here today, so thank you to everyone involved, and I know that this will be welcome news for many. Now, of course, much of the media attention has focused on football because it has that special life place in our national life. And recognising its significance, I set two challenges for football's return. First, that a reasonable number of remaining Premier League games would be broadcast free to air. And second, that the financial benefits of returning would be shared throughout the entire football family. So I'm glad to confirm today that a third of matches to finish the season will now be free to view, including the Liverpool versus Everton derby, and live Premier League football will be on the BBC for the first time in its history. This is an open invitation for all fans to be part of this significant moment in our sporting history. And it also, of course, has the really serious public health benefit of encouraging people to watch at home, which will be essential. Now, getting top leagues back up and running will also release much needed funding to support clubs lower down, many of whom are cornerstones of their local communities. And with both of these benefits, I can now make it official, football is coming back. Of course, these headline sporting events are only one part of the story. And I really am keenly aware that even as we reopen some domestic competitive fixtures, not all events will be back on. 
And given the deserved momentum that had built up behind women's sport after football, cricket and netball World Cups, I will be working hard with the sports minister to make sure we don't lose any of that progress. Visibility matters, and our daughters deserve to see, football, uh, to see female athletes on the main stage. Now, our focus is also on how we can get grassroots sports back up and running safely so that people can reunite with their local teammates. Now, while those teams can't compete together yet, today I'm glad to confirm that we are also relaxing the rules on exercise further so that from Monday, people will be able to exercise with up to five others from different households, crucially, so long as they remain two metres apart. That means that people who play team sports can train together and do things like conditioning and fitness sessions that don't involve physical contact. It's another vital and important step in the right direction. Now, we've all become a nation of early morning walkers, Wix workouters and evening park runners, and many of us have discovered how valuable and therapeutic physical activity can be, and I hope that we'll continue to make time for it even as life returns to normal. We still have a way to go, but for a sporting loving nation, today really is a significant milestone. We won't be sitting in the stands for a while, and things will be very different to what we're used to. But live sports will be back on our screens next week. The British sporting recovery has begun. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Professor Jonathan Van Tam. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, I'm now going to present the daily update to you, um, beginning with the first slide, please. And this slide um, shows Google mobility data. You can see on the left of the slide the vertical dotted line which shows um, when our um, lockdown measures started and you can see that rapid diminution in all forms of mobility um, and an increase in people staying in the residential home. Over time there have been small increases across the piece up until the end of this slide on the 21st of May but the big difference has been in the use of parks as it has been possible to um, ease social distancing, and that's very clear from the data. To the right of the slide, you will see for the period 21st to the 24th of May, from the Options and Lifestyle Survey of Great Britain, that um, almost 40% of adults um, worked from home, compared to around 12% at the same time the year before, and 98% of adults, very reassuringly, um, said they have continued to try to stay at least two metres away from other people when outside the home. Next slide, please. In terms of um, testing and new cases, to recap on the figures given to you by the Secretary of State, um, as of the 30th of May, um, 127,722 tests were conducted or shipped. Please remember again, that some individuals, a very small proportion, may have been tested more than once. But what you can really see to the right-hand side of the top of the slide is that the level of testing is staying very steadily now in and around the 120,000 tests per day mark. In terms of confirmed cases, there were 2,445 new cases as of the 30th of May. And if you refer to the bottom graph, you will see um, those data arrayed in graphical form. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to pass away from this slide without being clear to you that I have noticed uh, the, in the very tail end, the right side of the graph, um, some increase in cases in the last few days. But I want to be clear that that is a trend that we have seen before in these data. And what is rather more important is that you look at the seven-day rolling average, the blue line, which continues to show a clear downward trend. And that is important. Next slide, please. In terms of the uh, data from hospitals, there have been further declines in estimated admissions with COVID-19 uh, in England, 562. Um, compared with 675 one week ago. And the graph shows this continued decline. In terms of um, the percentage of ventilated beds occupied by COVID-19 patients, 
This has also continued to decline across the four nations and now stands at 10% compared with 12% one week ago. Next slide, please. These data, of course, show the total number of people in hospital with COVID-19 as opposed to the new admissions. And we are currently running at um, a little under 8,000 people in hospital with COVID-19, which is down from 9,400 this time last week. And with the exception of Wales, where there has been some changes to the reporting methods, you can see that there are continued declines in all other parts of the UK. Next slide, please. The final slide um, recaps again on the Secretary of State's announcement that as of the 30th of May, there were 215 further um, deaths attributed to patients with a confirmed uh, posit positive COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, the graph on the right shows the continued long-term decline with those week-on-week -week variations day by day. But again, importantly, the seven-day rolling average, the orange curve, continues to be downwards. And uh, that is the update on the statistics for today. Thank you, Secretary Jane. Thank you, Professor Van Tam. So first, we will go to questions from the public. And number one comes from Kim from County Durham, and that's via video. As you are starting to reopen public spaces, such as beaches and parks, and are planning to reopen the shops in the near future, I would like to know when you're planning to allow more access to public toilets, many of which remain closed, to allow those individuals who have disabilities to be able to go out the same way those who are able-bodied are able to do. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your question, Kim. And I, I know it's a really important point that you're raising, particularly people who suffer from disabilities do need to have uh, access to public toilets when they go out. And as soon as we are able to do so, uh, consistent with ensuring that we can do so in a safe way in accordance with public health guidance, uh, we will do that. And I know that uh, my friend, the Secretary of State, the person in charge of uh, uh, communities, housing and local government is looking into that as we speak. So hopefully we will be able to make progress on that. Thank you for your question. Uh, now, question number two comes from Leslie from Whitstable, who sent it via text, and I'll just read that out. Uh, why have England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland got their own track and trace systems, and how will these interact with one another to ensure you can capture everyone who may have been in contact with someone who has the virus? Well, I'm, I may ask uh, Professor Van Tam to, to add a little more detail on this, uh, Leslie. But uh, in response to your question, it's important to understand what we're trying to do with uh, track and trace. So essentially, as we begin to get the numbers of people with the virus under control in this country, we get smaller numbers, an important part of keeping those numbers down will be ensuring that we identify people who have the virus, so by testing them, and then we track who else they've been in contact with. That's why we've recruited 25,000 people who will do that. And then if they, if they come across people who've been in contact uh, with someone who has had coronavirus, they'll then ask them to self-isolate if appropriate. And that is to stop the disease spreading. Uh, we began that uh, in earnest on Thursday and will be up and running fully from the 1st of June, so that's Monday. But on, in terms of the, the detail on the interaction, would you like to address that, Professor Mantel? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, the NHS is a completely nationwide UK service for all its citizens, but it is a, just a case in point that the NHS is configured slightly differently across the devolved nations as it is in England, hence the organisation NHS England um, as opposed to NHS UK. Now, therefore, it is logical that there are slight differences to the track and trace system um, as it is going to be used across the different NHS jurisdictions and the different um, devolved administrations of the UK. But the real point here that I want to reassure people about is that identifying cases and tracing contacts is absolutely bread and butter and business as usual for the health protection agencies of the UK. They do this as a matter of routine for tuberculosis cases, for meningitis cases, for food poisoning outbreaks. 
And believe me, those don't always occur. Um, you can't say to a disease, we want you to stay this side of a border. It doesn't happen that way. And the health protection agencies of the UK are very used to working together and passing contacts and patients through as necessary. So I really have no real worries or doubts um, that they won't be able to cope with this in the particular COVID-19 circumstances. Thank you. And now we go to questions from the media. And the first one comes from Chris Mason of the BBC. Chris, are you there? Good afternoon, gents. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. You, and have been perpetual fear of uh, Zoom doom. A, a question to you both, uh, if I may. Um, what do you say to those scientists and others who say that you're easing the lockdown in England too quickly? Uh, thank you for that, that question, uh, Chris. Well, I think there's a couple of things just to note before I, uh, I asked uh, Professor Van Tam also to give his reflections. First, it's worth bearing in mind that uh, the scientific advisory group, the government's scientific advisory group, consists of uh, more than 50 uh, scientists, all of whom will have uh, their different uh, perspectives, and the government takes a collective view on, on the entire advice from SAGE. Secondly, I think uh, the scientists who I've heard speak this morning are absolutely right to urge caution. We are at a risky point. That is to say that we have got the R number below one. It's in the range of 0.7 to 0.9. But we haven't got that much headroom. That's why the Prime Minister has been clear that we need to proceed in a very cautious way. So we've set out a roadmap but at each stage, we're saying, well, we're not going to proceed with that unless we are confident that we can do so in a safe way. And indeed, if we're not confident, we'll delay measures or indeed we may even reimpose measures. That's the whole sort of baby step path that we are going down. So I think the government is, is broadly in agreement with what they're saying. But uh, Professor Van Tam, do you want to add anything? I'll just add a few things to say that um, scientific opinions always vary to some extent across the piece. That's natural. Um, SAGE, I think, has been very clear, and I am being very clear, that the easing of social distancing, the easing of lockdown, has to go slowly. It has to go painstakingly, and we have to be extremely cautious about how we do it. And the scientists will continue to give that advice to the government. No apologies for that. We will absolutely continue to do that. I believe, and I, I, you'll recall I was at the podium when the disease activity was very high in the UK, and I said it's a very dangerous moment. I believe this is also a very dangerous moment. We have to get this right. Now, um, the SAGE papers um, have been published. They're online, uh, many of them. Um, and it's very clear that the measures already taken to ease social distancing, SAGE have been very clear on that, that the chances of those easements allowing R to go above one are extremely low indeed. Now, the measures that have been announced to take place beginning Monday next week, um, SAGE again, I think, has been very clear. It has looked at a similar package of measures through the modelling and has taken a view that it is likely that with good compliance from the public and with a test and trace contact tracing system in place that these will not either violate our going above one that is not an absolute guarantee that they won't but it is a high degree of confidence providing contact tracing goes well and providing the public adhere to the limited easement in lockdown that's taking place and so i think there's a dual responsibility here that Contact tracing has got to go well, but the public have also got to engage with it and to take the advice about self-isolation if it's given because you're a contact very seriously. In terms of the advice about, for example, being able from Monday to meet five people outdoors, socially distanced, um, uh, you know, that's got to, again, be taken seriously and it's got to be taken in a reasonable measure. If you go out and you meet five people from different households in the morning, you being the sixth person, you then go and do the same in the afternoon and the same in the evening, you can see how the number of additional 
contacts that are potentially possible will just rack up. So people have got to be sensible and proportionate with the freedom that you know, we've absolutely wanted to give to people because we need to see loved ones. And if people go further and think, oh, it just won't matter, you know, I'll just go a little further with the measures that have been announced, then this won't work either. This virus, as I said last time I was at the podium, has a natural R of three. One case will infect three more people. It's like having a spring in a box and you've got the lid on. Now you can take the lid off a little, but you haven't disconnected the spring or broken the spring in any way. If you take the lid right off, the spring's still under tension, off it will go again. And so this is a dual responsibility here of government to go slowly and carefully and to take the advice from the scientists, of the scientists to watch this whole thing very closely over the next few weeks, and of the public in general to actually follow the guidance, don't tear the pants out of it, and don't go further than the guidance actually says. Thank Quick you. Follow -up. Any follow-up? Yes, go on, Chris. Uh, tearing the pants out of it, that's quite a phrase. Um, uh, just picking up on what, on what you both said, uh, do, do you accept that if you have to slam on the brakes or even reverse the measures that you've taken, getting people to comply then may be much trickier than it was in the earlier stages of the lockdown? Yes, I think, uh, in short, that is correct. That's why we have been uh, so at pains to move uh, with extreme caution in, in doing so. And it is worth noting that uh, there's been quite a lot of sort of loose talk about the ending of the lockdown, that sort of thing. We are taking very tentative steps, principally focused around uh, activities uh, outside where the risk of transmission is much lower. And we are emphasising through all of this the need to maintain social distancing. So most of the pillars of this uh, remain in place. But uh, Professor Van Tam, is there anything else you'd like to add? Thank to you, that? Secretary of State. Yes, I just add a little bit of science and say here that, look, um, infections pass on in a moment with COVID-19. And the, the incubation period is five days typically. And so the next round of infections appears fairly quickly after afterwards. In other words, this gets out of control quite quickly if you allow it to. And then as you've seen from the previous lockdown period, it then takes many weeks to get the brakes on it. You can't slow it down as fast as you can let it go, let it, let it take off. And that's because these cases then become problems for the healthcare system and regrettably some of them die. And it takes a while for them to work back out through the healthcare system because they require prolonged care. And therefore, from that perspective, um, you know, always see, don't see this as a curve that's the same going up as it is down. It's quite easy to go up. It's quite hard then to get the brakes back on. And so I really hope that people will follow the advice that is given to the letter and not any further than that. And therefore, we're never in that position again. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, next question is from Paul Brandt at ITV. Paul, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Um, Secretary of State, you're announcing further lifting of lockdown measures today, despite the fact that some of your own scientific advisers are expressing concern. Is this government still led by science? And to Jonathan Van Tam, if I may, you mentioned just then that one of the key things is having contact tracing in place to allow these lockdown measures to be lifted, but some of your colleagues are concerned that actually the contact tracing isn't well established yet. So are we really ready, given that the contact tracing may take another couple of weeks to really kick in? Well, thanks for your question, Paul. The, the first simple answer is yes, we continue to be led by the science. And indeed, I think uh, today's guidance is an excellent example of that. Uh, I pay tribute to Professor Van Tam and others who've been involved in this. We have had extensive discussions with the sporting bodies concerned uh, over a number of weeks. And we have come together with a, a package of guidance which we are confident uh, will minimise risks. And actually, I, I, mean, I will leave um, Professor Van Tam to elaborate on it. But in terms of the actual um, 
the, the narrow measures of uh, allowing the return of uh, elite sport behind closed doors within the stadium, the, um, the impact is going to be exceptionally minimal. Of course, we need to guard against wider impacts. For example, we need to ensure that people don't congregate around stadiums and so on. And that's why I very much welcome the fact that we've got uh, more games on free to air. There'll be a very important message for fans. And I, I think that fans uh, will behave responsibly. I think British people have shown real uh, good common sense throughout all of this. I'm sure they will understand the need to watch this at home. And that's an important message that we'll be uh, getting out. So I think uh, today's uh, announcement is an example of us working hand in glove with the with the scientists. But uh, Professor Van Tam, over to you. Yes, thank you. So, so elite sports men and women are a very, very tiny but important fraction of our society. And it's very clear that um, playing elite sport again in those very limited circumstances with carefully controlled measures about how you get those sportsmen, sportswomen to the pitch, um, that is not going to have any meaningful impact on R. It would be potentially completely different if there were lots of full stadia and all of the activities that go around going to a sports game, the restaurants, the pubs, the bars, etc. But we're not in that space at the moment. And so I think... Um, the actual return of elite sport is um, something that will be a nice fillip to us all um, after the lockdown at a psychological level, but I don't think it in any way is relevant to a conversation about R. Now, in terms of the, um, the, um, the track and trace system, yes, it is new. Yes, it was announced um, uh, last week. Of course, um, Many countries are now putting these systems in place and there will, as my Secretary of State has said, be some bedding in time required. But um, Baroness Harding has been very clear that um, the system is ready and um, I think we have to move forwards on that basis. Thank you. Any follow-up, Paul? Yeah, if I may, just, just on this point about the government following the scientific advice. I mean, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland take a slightly different view to England, in particular Scotland and Wales, which have been more cautious with their lockdown lifting. So what is it about the particular circumstances in England that, that makes you confident that it is OK to lift the lockdown measures to, to a greater degree in that nation? Well, each nation has to make its own decisions and it's up to the, the Welsh and Scottish governments to explain the decisions that they have uh, taken. In respect to the decisions that we have uh, announced, I think three things have been uh, influential in it. First is meeting those uh, five tests which the First Secretary of State, Dominic uh, Raab, set out a few weeks ago. The second thing that has been uh, influential in it has been ensuring that the R, which is part of the first uh, five tests, uh, remains uh, below one and gives us that, that headroom to be able to ease in a very cautious uh, careful, slow way, uh, without endangering the number uh, spiralling above one and having the consequences that Professor Van Tam talked about. And the third thing is, as part of our measures, we need to ensure that we have a good track and trace system in place uh, for the reasons that I outlined before, so that uh, once we are aware that somebody has had or has coronavirus, ensuring that they are tested and isolate, and then people that they come into contact with uh, take appropriate isolation measures to, to reduce the spread further. Uh, but Professor Van Tam, is there anything else you'd like to add? Thank you. O only really to say that, you know, Sir Patrick Valance has already said it from this podium, that um, the R is currently between 0.7 and 0.9. This means we do not have an enormous amount of headroom, and we will have to go very slowly and we will have to go very cautiously. And this is a time where um, there are potential dangers if we go too fast. And I'm fully aware of those, and I'm perfectly prepared to give that advice to the government as needed. Thank you. Uh, we now go to Lisa Holland from Sky. Afternoon, Lisa. Good afternoon. My question is for Professor Van Tam. 8,000 new infections every day, and that's just in England, and supposedly doesn't include care homes and hospitals. Can I ask you, who is catching coronavirus and how, uh, given that we're 10 weeks into lockdown? Let's go, let's go straight to you, Professor Van Tam. Right, okay, that, that's a difficult question. Um, I can't tell you 
who's catching coronavirus. Um, what I can tell you is the kinds of people that are, that are at risk of catching it and um, the kinds of people who are at risk of being hospitalised. The elderly, people with chronic underlying conditions and um, people who are obese. That's very clear. We have also um, are looking very carefully um, for other risk factors and um, the ONS has already um, shown that the death rate is higher in people in elementary occupations where perhaps social distancing is more difficult and we are in the middle of a very large inquiry looking at um, the black and minority ethnic uh, community. But it is, you're quite right, it's a case in point that there are um, 8,000 deaths, uh, 8,000 cases occurring a day according to ONS statistics um, and we need to get to the bottom of that. Thank you. And any follow-up? Yeah, if I could just ask for Professor again, uh, one of your own colleagues, John Edmonds, mm. uh, another government advisor, scientific government advisor, had said on Sky News today, my frustration has been the government are pretending uh, they're not making the decisions and it's us that are making the decisions, but that's not the case. Uh, that's what he says. What do you say? Do you think that is true? Could you repeat that question, please? Yes, we spoke to uh, John Edmonds on Sky News yeah. today who said, and I quote, my, fr my frustration has been the government are pretending they're not making the decisions. In other words, they're led by the science. Um, and it's us that are making the decisions, um, but that's not the case at all. So in other words, do you think the government is listening to the scientific advice? Uh, I should say just at the beginning, I know your question was uh, uh, addressed to President Van Tapp. Uh, the government has been clear along with Prime Minister has been clear that, that ministers take responsibility for, for decisions uh, based, but of course we take scientific advice in, in doing so. But uh, I, I don't know whether there's anything you, you so want to add further on that. I think that's absolutely right. Our, our, our science advice um, has been so far that the social distancing that has already been um, uh, eased um, is consistent with um, keeping the R below one. The consensus of scientific advice is that the next set of measures announced for Monday with contact tracing in place should also keep the R within one. Our advice is then to continue to watch this very carefully and we will continue to give further advice to the government about whether we think it is possible to make further easements after that. And that will absolutely be a matter of advice for us and decision for the politicians. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to Ian Herbert from the Mail on Sunday. Ian. Thanks very much. Um, a question for you, if I could, um, Secretary of State. Um, police forces have identified yesterday six Premier League games which present public health concerns and require neutral venues. Um, but clubs and fans are resisting that and insisting that their own home stadium will be safe. So if police express public health fears, uh, should clubs and fans accept that and accept neutral venues? Uh, well, the short answer is, is yes. I mean, it is worth just understanding what we are announcing today. So uh, the government is publishing guidelines which are setting out how uh, elite sports can resume behind closed doors in a safe way. It is then up to each individual sport to uh, uh, apply those guidelines and determine the way in, in which they, they do so. Uh, in respect of where matches uh, take place, there is uh, a well-established um, mechanism through the local safety authority. Uh, the local safety authority brings together police and local authorities to determine whether it is appropriate to have a match as scheduled at a, a home venue um, or not. If that determination is made that it is not safe to do so, and clearly we have to, they have to be mindful of risks such as uh, fans congregating, particularly if it's a, a crucial match and it's a, it's a home match around the stadium. If they advise that they shouldn't do it, then clearly fans should listen to that. But again, I, I pay tribute to fans because I think that in common with most of the British people, they've taken a sensible approach to this. They understand what we're doing. Everyone, uh, I think most people I've spoken to, welcome the fact that if we can uh, get live sport back again in a safe way behind closed doors, we should do so. But they understand the limitations of doing that in the, the current uh, environment. 
Uh, was there any of, oh, Professor Van yeah. Tam, do you want to come in? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so, uh, I'll, I'll say that you know the issue of fans congregating outside stadiums is clearly a um, police matter, and it's clearly something um, we would not want uh, in the current stage of social distancing. That's absolutely clear. But beyond that, in terms of the actual staging of the game itself, the premises have to be absolutely suitable for the new conditions in which we find ourselves. Um, this is about an end-to-end -end journey for um, the players, the officials, the media and the medical staff um, coming from wherever they live to take part in what is required for a game behind closed doors. And there has to be enough understanding that the venue can cope with the segregation and the organisation and the social distancing right up until the, the kick-off whistle. Um, to, and again, exactly from the end of the final whistle, to make that the safest possible experience for everybody there. And that's going to be a crucial factor as well in choosing these venues. And um, I know the Premier League are all over that and thinking about it very carefully. Thank you. Uh, any follow-up? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your answers on that. Um, it was interesting to, to hear you say, uh, Secretary of State, that uh, the Everton-Liverpool game will be one of the free-to-air fixtures, which is a significant um, gesture from Sky to give back to, to BBC. Is that designed to stop fans gathering at what would really be a, you know, a very high-profile game? And therefore, does that make it more likely that the game would be staged at Goodison Park, Everton, rather than a neutral ground? Because that was one of the six I referred to earlier. Well, uh, first of all, I should just clarify, uh, it will be free-to-air, that not all free-to-air matches will be on um, BBC. Uh, some will be on uh, other platforms that provide uh, free-to-air. But your, your point is correct nonetheless, and uh, one of the reasons why I was pushing uh, free-to-air broadcasting was precisely this point to um, discourage uh, fans from uh, going to, uh, first, principally, other people's houses to watch these uh, matches, but also to the stadia themselves. Uh, but I really do think in terms of the actual decision as to uh, where a match should take place, um, that's not a decision that I can best take as a politician. That is a decision that is best placed, uh, taken by the, the local authorities and the police through the local safety authority. That is the normal way for, for doing it, and I, I trust those mechanisms. But anything um, else you'd like to Yeah, add? so on the subject of fans gathering, um, I, I'm a... Um, devout Boston United season ticket holder and I'm desperate for football to come back but I've also talked earlier in in this um, uh, press briefing about sticking to the rules and not going further than the rules and fans gathering is exactly the kind of thing that would be um, something which went far beyond the kind of um, social distancing that we need to continue to practice and the kind of small numbers that we need to stick to as of Monday. And so this is how um, these guidelines begin to decay at the edges and then this will cause trouble for all of us if it happens. So I just want to be clear on that. Thank you. Uh, next up we have Lucy Johnson from Sunday Express. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Professor Van Tan said we need a period of bedding in before the contact system, uh, before we know it will go well. How will people know it is that they're having a genuine call from a contact tracer and not a scammer? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, first of all, I would say, obviously, we have, we've made a lot of progress with this in terms of recruiting the 25,000 uh, contact uh, tracers, and we've done a lot of work leading up to this, covering exactly those sort of points so people can have that uh, reassurance. But I think, Professor Van Tam, you're probably best placed to actually talk about the, the mechanisms of how that would work. Yeah. So um, all of that has been really carefully considered um, by the test and trace system. I don't have the details, but they are absolutely cited on the fact that there may be um, attempts to make malicious interference. Um, but actually, it would be quite difficult to do that. It would become apparent quite quickly that this was a professional talking who understood about contact tracing and the elements of it. I don't think people are going to fall for this. Uh, any follow-ups there, Lucy? I was also going to ask, um, there are scientific estimates that uh, potentially tens of thousands of healthy people will be asked to 
unnecessarily self-isolate at, of course, significant personal and economic cost after contact tracing. How can you stop this happening? Uh, well, I'm afraid we can't stop it happening, and this is part of the cost of uh, track and trace. Uh, we have made a decision as a government, and I think uh, I'll leave it to, to Jonathan to confirm, but based on uh, extensive scientific advice and discussions, that this is the trade-off that we are making. We're saying that in order to help facilitate wider easing of the lockdown that will benefit everyone, it will be the case that uh, if people have uh, had coronavirus, been tested, and then they've been, they've been in contact with others, those people will be asked to uh, isolate. And it will, for those people, that's not something they will particularly want to do. But I, I hope that the British people, and this is my sense throughout all of this, there has been this a common sense and understanding of, of why we're doing this. This is to, to benefit uh, the wider public health. And in isolating, they are helping to ensure that we keep the R rate low and that we can continue to ease as is safe to do so. And I think that is an improvement on the very uh, stringent uh, lockdown measures that we, we had before we commenced this process. But, but Professor yeah. Van Tam, is there any other So I'm going to go back to my spring and the fact that, um, you know, the coronavirus is like a coiled spring ready to get out if we don't and start infecting many people again if we don't keep on top of it. Now, the epidemiological principle of stopping that transmission occurring is taking people who have the infection, who are infectious, out of the system through isolation at home and also taking out of the system temporarily people they may already have infected. Now, if you and I were contacts um, in a meaningful way that Public Health England said meant that you might, I was the case, you might in the next 14 days, because that's the incubation period, um, develop coronavirus infection and you may become infectious to others one or two days before your symptoms show. The only thing I can do is say to you that your risk window is for the next 14 days and please will you isolate for the good of others. And we'll all have to take that on the chin if it happens to us because we can't look inside people and say, well, you've definitely been exposed and for you, your symptoms are going to appear on day X. It's just not possible. We can't even say of the people who are exposed, which ones will be the ones that go on to be the next round of cases of coronavirus infection. And so, yes, it is going to be painful for some people when they receive a notification, um, when PHE contact them and say, you are a definite um, contact of um, somebody who's had coronavirus infection. We need you to stay at home for the next 14 days. But as the Secretary of State clearly said, and he's absolutely right, the alternative is that we go back to stopping those contacts occurring through whole of society isolation otherwise known as lockdown. So we either try and live with this in the best way we can and have something towards a normal life, or we have to um, tolerate this system with some of the difficulties it's going to bring for some people. Thank you. Um, and now finally uh, to Toby Helm from The Observer. Hello, could I ask the uh, Secretary of State first of all, um, the Prime Minister when talking about Dominic Cummings earlier this week, um, said that while he wanted uh, him to remain in post, uh, he said that he was leaving it to the public to decide what they thought of the controversy surrounding him. Um, a few days on, it's pretty clear what the public do think. We are running an opinion poll today which shows a very, very high majority of people believe he should be sacked. Uh, there's a petition showing more than a million people believe the same thing and MPs' inboxes are groaning with complaints. So will the Prime Minister, will the government listen to the public or will it simply ignore them? And could I ask Professor Van Tam, you say this is a very dangerous moment. Um, so what do you say to people in authority 
should it be the people in should should people in authority give a lead and obey the rules above all uh, well let, let me deal with your first question first uh, toby that as as you well know and uh, many uh, viewers will know uh, Dominic Cummings gave uh, a very extensive uh, explanation of his uh, behaviour on Monday and answered all questions in, in relation to that. And the Prime Minister accepted that uh, explanation and uh, on that basis kept um, him in post. And that remains the position. Uh, Professor Van Dam, anything you want to add? Yes, thank you for the question. and I'm quite happy to answer it. Um, in my opinion, the rules are clear and they have always been clear. In my opinion, they are for the benefit of all, and in my opinion, they apply to all. Uh, any follow-up, Toby? Um, just follow-up to the Secretary of State. You didn't yeah. actually address the direct question, um, as far as I remember. I mean, is, is, the, is the Prime Minister, is the government actually going to listen to the public, or is it just going to ignore them? Uh, well, of course, the Prime Minister and the government uh, listen to the, the public. In respect of uh, Ms Dominic Cummings, this has been dealt with extensively. The Prime Minister um, has answered questions on it repeatedly. Dominic Cummings has answered questions uh, repeatedly on it. I understand that people have a, a range of views in respect of it. It is worth noting that uh, Durham Police have uh, made their, their statement in, in respect to that in terms of not taking any further action. So I think that this has now been dealt with. Um, on that note, I think we are now finished. Thank you very much. And that concludes the afternoon press briefing. Thank you.